create a perfect world in our heads. Why waste time? And they all need money. Now let's see if they're brave enough to earn it. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Resourceful Agent Radio Show. I'm your host, Andy Silvius, and today's guest is Mike Acker. Uh, from drug smuggling parents to smuggling Bibles into communist China, Mike is an executive and communication coach, a keynote speaker, and the author of four books, including the best-selling Speak With No Fear. So thank you for being here today, man. Yeah, absolutely, Andrew. You know, it's so interesting when you hear back your own story, drug smuggling parents to now executive coach, of course, of course, that makes obvious <laughs> sequential sense. Yep, I know. I had to throw that in there for your intro because... I didn't know how else to work it into the show without it being weird. Um, <laughs> yeah. And it was something that needed to be brought up. So I figured <laughs> do it right off the bat. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Well, just a plug for, for my dad, he took his experience when he was in eighth grade and he said, I'm going to, I'm going to live an eventful life so I can write a book about it. So he did at 72, he finished and published his first book, Pirates, Scoundrels and Saints. And it is a lot of fun. And when I read it, I thought, you know what? This is just every single person is my dad, and all the yeah. drug smuggling adventures are just his stories told from different points of view. And that's the so, book sitting on your bookshelf behind you, right? That is, yeah, that yeah. is. I know that's not what we're talking about at all, but it is fun to finally meet my dad. That's awesome. That's awesome. Now, did, did you grow up with your dad, or was he? Yeah, that sounded bad. <laughs> I grew up with my dad. He but meeting him he, before you were born. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because he doesn't talk about those stories with me. Right. So I had to read his fiction book based on nonfiction activities to really meet my dad, That's how funny. he was before I was born. That's awesome. So where are you recording this from? I'm in my home studio. This is in Fairhope, Alabama. And then I'll be back in Seattle here soon. So I can bounce between the Gulf Coast and the Pacific Northwest. Awesome. Um, and... Let's go ahead and get into how you got started. But before that, um, where can people find, uh, reach out to you, find your book? Um, how can they contact you or buy your products? Yeah, mikeacker.com. So acker, like cracker, mikeacker.com. You can find me all over Google or Amazon elsewhere. And I do coaching programs. I got books. I do keynotes, a lot of different things that I do. Would love for someone to reach out to me and to just talk about the impact that what we talked about today has made on you or how a book has made an impact on you. Those books have literally gone around the world. And I have clients from literally around the world who have picked up that book and it's helped them out. And so today I hope to you and your audience, I trust that what I say here will help you get a leg up in your journey. Yeah, no, I know it will, especially from our, our conversation before we actually got on the podcast. Um, now, from what I remember from our last conversation, you uh, used to be a pastor, correct? That's right. So why don't you give us a little backstory about, you know, how you became a pastor and then what led you out of that into what you're doing currently? Yeah, I never wanted to be a pastor. I said, that's not going to happen. I don't want to do that. I have no desire to that, do that. Yeah. In fact, I was working as hard as I could not to do it when I was a junior in high school. <laughs> and so I thought, no, I don't want this. And then... I moved back to the United States for some family stuff. We ended up moving back. And during that time, I just met some people that really dramatically impacted my life who happened to be pastors and who still are involved in my life. One is now my financial advisor and he's just a fantastic guy. And one is still a pastor. And so just seeing their impact, seeing their integrity, seeing their way of life. And then they saw something in me. And often I think the first step that happens in our life is someone sees something in us and then it propels us to start seeing that in ourselves. Right. And they saw that I could have some of that, that influence, some of that impact in other people. And I got to do that. I got to do that. So I followed those steps. I took the education I needed to along with some other education. I started my internship with them and I really started walking down this path of pastoral ministry. And at 22, I became an associate pastor at 26. I became a senior pastor at a small church in about an hour north of Seattle in a small place called Stanwood. We always said Stanwood. <laughs> and in Stanwood, we got to do some incredible, incredible 
healing the world type activities like we did wells and we funded all kinds of different programs not only did yeah we talk about the bible talk about jesus but we also really wanted to do what it said so we did so many schools we did so many homes we built so many different programs out to help heal the community and beyond so that was a lot of fun from there i ended up going to another church and was there for several years and that church was in one location 75 people and had through a series of bad events in the 2007 era lost a lot of money and a lot of of their their land that they had for years so i got to lead them back into a place of solvency out of 4.5 million dollars of debt wow. due to land in 2007 and then after we got to a place of solvency i left and then joined the team at a a mega church down in California where I was speaking to about 6,000, 7,000, 8,000 people on a regular basis. And then I got to a spot where I had done it. I'd been there for 18 years. And so I thought, you know what? I'm just curious to see what else I could do. And I could stay in this world. I still believe in the message, still attend church. But what is it that I could do elsewise? And so I was with a group of friends and a buddy of mine said, I'd hire you in a heartbeat. And I said, what do you do? And he said, I distribute veterinary products. And I said, I didn't even know that was a job. And I'm rocking the shirt today. <laughs> oh, and nice. so I said, absolutely, let's do it. So we ended up going there and I took a $800,000 territory, built it to 4 million the first year. But along the way, I always had a side project ever since California. And even before that, I was coaching people in communication, coaching people in leadership. There's business leaders I was coaching. There was people who wanted to go speak. There was someone who would listen to me speak and go, hey, how do you do that? Can we sit down for coffee? And then I started a side business and that side business kept growing and growing and growing. Eventually it led to writing a book and eventually it led to me doing what now I do full-time is just this. But it was this pathway of really leaning into what people say, leaning into the next step. All of that goes back to this. And I encourage people to have a mission statement for their life and to keep on revising it. All of that goes back to this one statement. My mission in life is to help people realize their potential. So as a pastor, I did it in terms of faith and I did it in terms of good works in the world. Then in veterinary practice, I helped veterinarians build out their practice and provide excellent care. And I was a speaker and executive coach or author, helping people bring out their communication potential, their leadership potential. But yeah. it all ties to that. That's awesome. One, it's been, you sound like you've lived a very eventful life. And for somebody who can take those risks, I mean, were you scared at all when you transitioned out of the church to do something else that was not so much in your comfort zone anymore? I think I was scared when I thought about it. So my, it was a friend who was offering it to me. And he, we were living in California, so he flew up just to flew down to meet with us and just said, do you know what you're getting yourself into? I think he was more scared for me. And so I felt like I had someone who, who believed in me and yeah. really, really, I've, I've had different bosses in my life. He was probably the best boss I've ever had and not, not flamboyant in any way, not like this super outgoing, charismatic, crazy, but he was just one of those people who wanted you to succeed and so he, he took me under his wing per se, because he'd been in the industry for a long time. And he just really helped me succeed. The only reason I was so successful in my first year is because of his work with me. So that reduced the fear. I was a little bit nervous going into it. Once I got into it, having him there to talk to really, really helped. Yeah. And along the way, he would do things like this. He'd give me a call and just check in with me. And so any losses out there listening, the ability for you to say, I'm with you and I have your back is one of the best things that you can say for your employees. And it's really one of those things that will either make it or break it. And I knew that he had my back. And I knew that if I failed, he would actually take it upon himself because he knew I was trying, that he would take it upon himself to really own the outcome of that failure and get me back to a place of success. Like he would take responsibility. If you weren't achieving the things you needed to achieve, it would have been his failure for not teaching you. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. I think, I think that um, this is my opinion, but more leaders, business owners should, should approach things that way. 
when your team is failing. Um, and I know there's people out there that have been in business far longer than I have, but when your team is failing, if you're the one who owns all the responsibility of why they're failing, chances are you're going to end up growing a much better team than if you put it on everyone else and always blame them for them making the mistakes. Cause at some point right. you could have taught them something better to do it along the way. Right. And, and along the way, not only could you taught them something better, but you could have served them to a way that they were able to raise up. I love that whole meme that's out there somewhere on LinkedIn or somewhere where there's two different bosses. One boss is saying, come, come and pulling everybody. And the other boss is saying, you go, you go, I've got your back. I got your back. And it's yeah. that whole idea of, do you work for me or do I work for you? And I believe yeah. that the boss actually works for the employees. Yeah. A good boss. What, 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 what you would consider, that's actually what I would consider a leader and not a boss. You know, like if you look right. at a that typical, so, but um, something I was going to ask you too was you mentioned that during all of this, you were doing your side projects of coaching people along the way. I feel like I've met a lot of people, especially through podcasting and, and different business events that have a message that, to share or something they can offer to other people, but they feel like they haven't done enough, right? So they almost, they're worried about having the imposter syndrome of coaching other people in their environment or helping other individuals. Did you ever feel that way when you were helping um, coach people and, and coach business owners and things like that? So the short answer is no, because I had been doing a lot of this for a long time. Mm -hmm. And so I had been speaking. And so I do have the experience and the backdrop of, hey, I've spoken to 10,000 people on a weekend. I've spoken to 5,000 people in one go. And I've done this for a long time. And I know how to do that. And I've led at a large level, overseeing lots of money, done all these different things. So I wasn't worried about that. I think a lot of the value comes from two different thoughts. Knowing what you've done to achieve that value. And then the second one, believing that you have the value. Now, sometimes people have one and they don't have the other. Mm -hmm. I believe I value, hire me. <laughs> well, no, but they don't have don't. the value, yeah. Or people have the experience, but they don't believe they have the value. And then the third part would be, what are people willing to pay? So if you go onto my website, you'll see that's $350 an hour and people are willing to pay for my hourly fee. So why would I drop it? Now there's different things I do for different programs that bring it down, or if I'm doing a large bundle that it brings it down. But I know the value because I know that people have paid it and will pay it. And a lot of people, times people are afraid of, of stating that, which it is. And by the way, when I first started, <laughs> I guess, I guess it goes back to yes on this part right here is when I first started, I was like, I'm going to do some coaching. And instead of doing it the normal way where people come to me, I'm going to actually put myself out there and do some coaching. How much should I charge? I'll charge $40 an hour. No, that's probably too much. I'll just charge $30 an hour. So then I had my first client at $30 an hour. I'm like, hey, I was pretty good. Yeah, I, I got this. I do have some experience. And then I did $40 an hour. And I kept on stepping it up. And so I kind of fill up my funnel. Remember, mm -hmm. I was occupied and busy, worried or working elsewhere. Right. And I kept on raising it until I got further and further and further up. And then I, then I just made the, the jump up there because even $350 an hour, it's not like you're working 40 hours a week at $350 an hour. You're, right. A couple hours a week, do, probably depending on the amount of clients. Yeah. There's, there's all the work that goes with it and there's programs and stuff I run, yeah. but all that to say is value comes into that experience and then the belief and then what are people willing to pay? Well, and in the belief section of it, because you and I had this discussion about mindset before, um, a lot of people are have insecurities, underlying insecurities that, that don't allow them to reach their full potential, right? Mm -hmm. So what do you do when you're working with coaching clients to bring them out of that, to, to help them realize what their potential is, that they actually could do these things? Yeah. One of the things I love to have people do is study themselves. And I think a lot of people don't actually know themselves because they don't study themselves, partly because they're afraid of studying themselves. Yeah. What will you see if you study yourself? What will you see that you don't like? And there's things that when I've studied myself, I go, I don't really like that about myself, but it's inherent in who I am. So I can look at some different speakers out there and go, okay, I can hold a crowd. I can speak, but 
I can delineate what they do that I don't do and that I have not been able to learn no matter how much I try. Yeah. And so they have a whole nother realm of excellence in their speaking than I do simply because of this. And I studied myself. Therefore, I know that about myself. I've also studied myself as a coach. Now I've coached hundreds of people. And I just got off a call and I can see the growth that they have. And I can see the growth the CEO had that I worked with yesterday from a multi-billion dollar company. And the CEO that I was in Mexico with the week before for a multi-billion dollar company. And so I can see the growth and I go, ah, that reinforces it. What is it that I'm doing well that's helping them? I'm doing this and this and this. So that study of self, and a lot of people just haven't studied themselves. So I would say, if you want to believe in yourself, if you want to break through the mindset, study yourself with a absolute honest lens of who you are. Like good to great says that, I can't remember the exact words on good to great, but it's talking about as a business, you gotta be brutally honest yeah. with yourself. So what is it that when you're brutally honest with yourself, you know you do well and you don't do well? Where is it that you look at yourself and you wanna coach? You wanna coach in real estate, you wanna coach in podcasting, you wanna coach here. I was met some different people in these different areas and they, they think of themselves, their valuation of themselves is very high. But if they were brutally honest with themselves and with some outside study as well, a 360 feedback loop, they would realize that mm, there's something they do that is not good. One of the things I do when I'm working with CEOs is I ask them, what is the one annoying thing that you do? Because all of us do an annoying thing. All oh, of okay. us do an annoying thing. And when I ask that way, because I mean, these are people who are uber successful. When I ask people that way, it's it's protecting their pride as well. <laughs> like, uh, well, you know, okay, I do this and that. And then they can usually find a couple other things. So if you're listening and thinking, I want to go into the space of speaking or writing or coaching or podcasting or whatever it might be influencing study yourself with a brutal honesty, what you do, what you do well, what you do poorly, then figure out how you can maximize your strengths and figure out how you can really cover over or get people to help you or, or improve your weaknesses. That's going to add value to everything that you do. Well, and I think that's where coaching comes in, right? Because a lot of people, even as they're doing their self-study, some people just aren't even aware of some of the things they might be doing. And I think the self-study thing is awesome because it teaches you through habit of studying yourself to just become self-aware. Yeah. It probably becomes more natural as that goes on. Uh, but that's probably where, would you agree that you bring a coach in to be able to see the things that you, those people can't see? Yeah. And, and if you can't even get a coach, just getting like a group of friends around you and giving them, Hey, would you just do this little quiz I put together? You know, it's on SurveyMonkey, it's anonymous. And just, I wanna find out what I do well, what I think, you know, where do I disconnect with people? Yeah. What do you think about this? And if you just did a SurveyMonkey about that, you could do your own 360 degree feedback loop. Other things that I encourage people to do in terms of studying is doing every single possible test that you can, the Enneagram, the Strengths Finder, the DISC, the Myers-Briggs, the whatever, whatever, all the different ones that are out there. Study yourself profusely till you get to a point where you go, okay, I see it. And then have a coach walk through with you and take that next step and take it further and help that help you create a plan to get you where you want to go. Yeah. So what is your big why? What, what pushes you to continue achieving the amount of success that you've achieved so far and then to continue going forward. Every single morning I pray this prayer, God help me people, help me help people today. So coming on to the podcast, I just centered myself for a quick moment and thought, okay, help me help people today. That That's ultimately my, my big goal as, as a pastor and anything I've done, help me realize people's potential that in people, I think this is a infuriating thought. In people, there's a potential that we have and potential means it's something that you can achieve that you haven't yet, right? That's what potential is. And so there's potential that we have inside us for something great and fun and impactful and amazing and legacy leaving. Yet it's potential, so it hasn't happened yet. 
I think it's infuriating to find out if people get through their life. And if you're at 70 years old and you still have potential, in my opinion, you failed. At 70 years old, and my dad is 72, I don't want to have potential. I want to have realized the potential and turn potential into actual, to turn potential into experience. At 70, I don't want potential. I want experience. And so my goal, the thing that keeps me going is how can, how can I help you realize your potential? So a big thing that I work on with people, because my book is Speak With No Fear, yeah, is easing anxiety, easing fear in communication. So I had this thought one time, uh, someone asked me, Mike, what should I take to help me with my fear? And so I started studying because I didn't know I'm not a doctor and I can't prescribe. Yeah, take this. So I started studying and I came across a whole bunch of herbs, adaptogens. And I thought that's fascinating. And I kept on studying and studying it. So something that I've created that comes out this fall, because of that question right there, how can I help people? I'm launching a supplement. And the reason why is because it helps people realize their potential. So that's a, another thing that I got going off on all of a sudden, Andrew. And then I had this other thing that happened. I was getting some speaking gigs that I couldn't do myself and some other ones that I wasn't qualified to do. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not this. I haven't done that. I'm not a female. I'm a whole bunch of different things. I'm not. So how can I help them realize their potential for the event? How can I help other speakers realize their potential? So I started a speaker agency. So the different things that I have in my life, the things that I have going on, the four different buckets, they all come from this idea of how can I help people realize their potential? And how am I gifted to do that? Like, if you have potential, Andrew, in basketball, I'm not going to be able to help you realize it. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's zero, zero potential ability for me to raise that out of you. If you have potential in speaking, if you have potential in leading, if you have potential in some other areas, that that I could partner with people and help them out with. So you ever struggle getting people to realize their own potential? Yeah, all the time. Like I... I'm like a, I'm a quasi motivational coach where, and people have picked up my book before and said, oh, this is just a motivational pep talk. Someone left that review on Amazon. This is a motivational pep talk. And I said, yeah, yeah, it is. It's motivating people to realize their potential and to do it and believe they can. At almost every single beginning of almost every single book, I have this whole thing about, you have to believe that you can do it. Otherwise you can't. I believe what Henry Ford said whether you believe you can or cannot, you're right. Right. True. If you believe you cannot become a better speaker, you are right. And don't, don't sign up for my programs because you're going to bring down the, the overall rating of it. But if you believe yeah. that you're not good right now, but you can be better, come on in. Let's do it. Let's work together. And if uh, my newest book is on emotional intelligence, and if you believe that you are destined for failure and you just can't get ahead and nobody likes you, you are right. But if you believe that you just need to know the right tools for you to get ahead and build the relationships that you want, you're also right. And I can show you how. So again and again, with that potential, there's been times where I've just said, I can't do this with you. I can't be your coach because you don't believe you can get better. And at what point, and the, the reason I'm asking this, I've had people in my life that I have tried to help in that same way, right? You, you know, they've got a ton of potential, but there is at some point, there is an insecurity or a block in their mind that just, they start making progress. And then it's almost like subconsciously, they deter themselves off of that track. And typically it's because they, correct me if I'm wrong, but typically that's because they don't believe they can. Therefore, subconsciously, they make decisions that that pull them off of the path of where they're headed to whatever success that it is that they want, right? Yeah, and it might not even be that they're making new decisions, they're just not making any decision, which of course is a decision. So if I'm, I just don't believe I'm making advances and improving my communication, I'm gonna stop trying. Yeah. So it's not even that they're throwing a grenade there to blow everything up and all of a sudden get <laughs> worse communicators, they're just right. stopped doing it. I think we've all done that in our physical sure in our physical bodies and our physical fitness, where we've been making that progress and then we stopped and we've stopped seeing the progress. I think a lot of people, they just, they don't believe it's worth it or they say it's a value, but it's not a priority. And if your value is not a priority, then it's not a value. So what are some strategies that you use for people to, to really change their mindset when 
when they are struggling in those areas? Is there anything or exercises or something that you do with them to get them to shift their focus or their belief? Yeah. Studying yourself is one of them. Okay. So help you understand yourself is definitely a shift in mindset because if you understand who you are and you understand that, Oh, that's not a weakness for, for example, on me, when I studied myself, I always thought I was impulsive. And then I studied myself and I found out that actually I'm an extreme action taker. And so if I come up with an idea, I'm why wait, yeah. this is a good idea. Let's do it now. It's stupid to wait. Let's do it. And so what I realized was I'm not impulsive, negative. I'm an action taker. Now there's some weaknesses that come on strengths, but I want to see it as a strength, be aware of the backside of weakness, but, but take it as a strength. So studying yourself is a huge part of mindset. Maybe you have the right or the wrong mindset because you've never studied yourself. And so you're comparing yourself to what someone else be, is because they're a processor and you're not a processor. So the second one is really be careful of the language that you have for yourself. In my third book, Lead With No Fear, I wrote this with Steve Gutzer and we talk about the move from victim to leader mentality. So a lot of people have this victim mentality of look what happened to me. And in the book, we retell the story of Steve at a burn camp. And I've been part of those as well. And so I, I was very familiar with this. And as we're writing this, he says, I was at this burn camp and here's all these people who have been burned up to 90% on their body. And as I was speaking, he says, and we write this in the, in the book, as I was speaking, I said these words, I'm sorry, I don't even know really what to say because I've never really talked to burn victims. And someone came up to him afterwards and said, Mr. Cutzer, we don't refer to ourselves as victims, but as burn survivors. And it was like this epiphany in his mind. Oh my gosh, a lot of things have been happening to these people. They've been victimized, but they don't see themselves in the box of victimhood. They see themselves as someone who survived. Therefore, they actually live with greater purpose because they got through it. So instead of I'm in a box and poor me, look what happened to me. I survived. Now, how can I thrive? So we write about how can you move from victimhood to this, the survival and then ultimately this leader mentality. And that's a huge part when I'm, when I'm talking to people and coaching people, I'm saying, what, I often trick them. I'm like, what, what goes through your mind when you're going throughout the day? And they're like, well, you know, I said, no, let's really dive in. Let me, let me know, like, what's, what are you telling yourself? And and like sometimes good things, sometimes bad things, you know, might, you might say to yourself, oh man, I hope I look okay. And I hope I don't smell. But then you might also say, you know, everybody else is more experienced than me and they're not really caring what I say. And then that usually triggers something They go, yeah, you know, I, sometimes I see myself saying that, why should they listen to me? And so I get them to realize this mentality. And often it's this victim mentality. Their self-talk. And self -talk. that. Yeah, their self-talk, their self-speech. Yeah. Every communicator has a soft speech. So as I'm talking to you, I'm thinking to myself, what I say will help you if you do it. It's mm -hmm. literally the track in my mind that's going through. But it changes. If I thought, ah, they already know this, then I would say it really fast and then finish off. Your self speech, your self talk, the, the mentality that you have, the mindset that you have, so huge. So part of what I do to help people realize potential, study yourself. So that's going to help you. The second one would be understand the mentality and then change that mentality by purposefully capturing those thoughts and changing those thoughts. And the third one, I would say this to help people realize their potential is your potential is actually not about you. So, so who would you be about? <laughs> so who you can impact? Yeah, every time we talk, every time we lead, the moment we think it's about us, we get stuck. And all of a sudden, there's a lot of pressure on us. So think about this. If I go up on stage and I'm speaking to maybe 500, 500 realtor agents, okay? So I go up there and I'm speaking to them. And I think, man, I'm not a real estate agent. Why would they listen to me? You know, this is, I hope they like me. Maybe I can be funny. I hope they think that I'm funny. I hope, I hope I don't mess up. I hope I can say something. And I got all these hopes. And as a result of all those hopes, 
and all of those eyes in there, what happens the whole time I'm self-conscious. Yeah. But if I get up there and go, okay, I've been invited to this event because I can help people speak successfully. I'm going to give them some gold and this is going to be absolutely phenomenal. When they lean into this, it's going to change the way they talk to the clients. Then now all of a sudden I'm there. I'm like, okay, I don't care what you think about me. I don't think you care what you think about my hair, what you think about my clothes. I mean, I'm trying not to be distracting, but I don't care about any of that. All I really care about is if I can help you. Yeah. Think about it like this. If you stand in the front of the mirror and you've gotten all dressed up and you're going to big event, what are your eyes on yourself? What do I look like? Do I smell good? Do I look good? Does my hair cut well? Do I need a haircut? Do I have other hairs that are on my face that need to be <laughs> that plucked out? I mean, what, what do I have going on that's wrong with me? But if you go down to Mexico and you're building a house for a family that's living in a tar paper shack, they have six kids and they have a wild crime rate in the neighborhood. And so the mom's worried about her safety when her husband's away on long work trips. And so you're there for a week and you're going to build their house in one week. So you wake up early in the morning and you get out there and it's dirty and it's dusty and you're sweaty and it's hot and you work late and yeah, the deodorant no longer works and you're with a whole bunch of other people. And you, who do you, when you get back home to the hotel or wherever you're staying and you look at the mirror, do you know what you think about? Good job. Yeah, you might go, yeah, I look like a mess, but do you care? Not at right. all. Because you're doing something for someone else. And if we have the mindset of, I really, I don't want to be distracting. So I want to make sure that I'm groomed, but I don't really care what you think about me as long as I can help you. Yeah. Then that right there allows you to be pushed into your potential because you're never going to really reach your potential when all the arrows of your life are at you. If you're all wrapped up in yourself, you make a pretty small package. But when you start thinking about others, man, that's where impact. Well, and to touch back on the self-talk thing, you know, I feel like I've gone through a massive transformation in my life over the last four or five years. And uh, especially being in business, I got into personal development, which if you would have talked to me out of high school, I would have been one of the guys that thought I was dumb, wasn't going to do anything with my life. And for whatever reason, you know, I had those insecurities, didn't think I'd ever go anywhere. But as you work on that too, I mean, when I started learning about personal development and working on myself and really self-analyzing kind of what you're talking about with your coaching, um, your self-confidence builds. And then you, when you realize yeah. that you do have things to offer to other people, it's almost like you become unstoppable, right? Not, not in like a cocky way, but just in a way of like, you don't have those self doubts holding you back anymore from achieving the things that you want to go after and to help other people. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's really amazing to see how far people can go if they put themselves into it Yeah. and how you can grow and how you can excel and how you can, I mean, the potential that we have is so and crazy amazing. I mean, even, even going back to my dad, I mean, he's 72 now. He had realized so much by the time he was 65. And even though I said, you know, there's at the age of 70, I don't want to look back. Yeah. But even there, he's looking at it going, what's my untapped potential? So mm -hmm. my dad at 65 starts a law firm again. Okay. And yeah. then at, at 72, he releases a book. And so even though you want to look and go, okay, if you're 40, you want to be looking or 30 or whatever you are, you want to be looking at how can I realize my potential now? And because you don't want to get to a certain age and go, man, I had so much potential, but I'm the same. You don't want to be the same person at 70 as you are at 40. That's the bottom line. No. But then there's still new things that you're unlocking. And the potential that you unlock now releases new levels of potential later on that you can unlock and realize. And so even when going back to all my career changes, I didn't know I could write a bestseller book that has over 500 <laughs> reviews and ratings on Amazon. has been translated into different languages. I didn't know that. But by stepping out into the unknown and working on it and trying something, I was able to achieve things I didn't even know I could. Well, and it's, it, I believe it's a work in progress and it will be until the day that we die, right? Because you're, you should always be working on yourself as soon as you are comfortable in a situation, you're probably not growing very fast personally. Yeah. 
And yeah, I think that I think right. when people push themselves into those uncomfortable positions or doing things that they don't really think they can do, just like you, you said with your book, right? Uh-huh. You're tapping into that potential. Your dad's doing it at 72 and he'll probably have however many more things he's going to do before his life here ends. And uh, I don't know. I just think it, it's never, I think a lot of us, a lot of people, right? Think of things as a destination point. Like, oh, I'm going to work on myself to get to here. Mm-hmm. But when you get there, if you stop, you're, you're not, you're just stagnant. You're not going anywhere. I think that people yeah. need to think of it as just a lifestyle change that you're always consistently working on yourself to be the better person at the end of the day. Yeah. I think you said that really well. You are always working on ourselves and, and we're always working on ourselves in different areas. So we're yeah. working on ourselves in terms of, for example, the ability for us to connect with one another and then our ability to communicate and our ability to lead and our ability to do this and this and this. And I think that that inspiration can easily be, can be easily be drawn from Benjamin Franklin. He chose, but it was seven or eight values. And then he just chose to work on one every year. And it's very interesting. I love this. He had seven and someone added an eighth. That's what happened. I don't said, think I'm familiar someone with Someone said, yeah, he said, you should work on, on humility. So he's like, yeah, you're right. That sounds like a good one. And at the end of his life, he had made serious progression on seven out of the eight and humility was the one he didn't have. And he said, I don't know why you need humility if you've achieved as much stuff as I have. <laughs> so, I, thought, I don't know. That's a little side note. <laughs> yeah. But it's true. That potential that we all have, if we systematically work on it, we can achieve it. So I usually do quarterly goals for mm-hmm. myself and then for my business and for other areas. And then I weave in there a good amount of routine with novelty to motivate myself. I like that too, with because I think um, I'm definitely a routine person, right? To, to be able to continue achieving more every day and, and progressing in business and life, I get very stuck in my routines, but having the, the novelty or doing something to incentivize you to continue is important because I've definitely gotten on the, the routine side too heavy at times. And then you just get bogged down almost. It doesn't become exciting anymore. Yeah. So I'm on the other side. I'm a novelty guy. And I'm like, what's new? Let's do, let's do something new. So I have yeah. to very much discipline myself to do things on a routine base and just make sure that I stay on it. Cause otherwise, I mean, I could jump on orange theory this week and CrossFit this week and this program this week and that program <laughs> this week. And I could do that with everything I'm doing elsewhere too. Yeah. So I have to make my map and make sure I stick to my book writing plan and make sure I stick to the coaching goals that I have, et cetera, et cetera. Right. But those two work well together. And sometimes people just live by novelty or they just live by routine, but the two should go hand in hand. Yeah. So I want to get into a few fun questions with you before we end up wrapping up. Um, I uh, I lost my spot where I was at. (laughs) All right. If you had one hour to meet someone anywhere in the world at it from any time who would it be well this this is this is i mean i come from a pastor right so mm-hmm. i think there's two people so I'll, i won't go jesus because that's just too close <laughs> <laughs> but i think it'd be fascinating to meet moses I and mean, talk about a guy who he thought he was going to achieve everything by the time he was 40 and then he was off and so he essentially failed in his mission went off for 40 years and just kind of retired and then at 80, he had to go back on. And I think it'd be just really interesting to talk to him. But I'd like to talk to him at different points in his life. Like, I like to meet him at 40. Like, so what went wrong? Like to meet him at 80. Like, so why did you stop? And then meet him at 120 and be like, so Moses, give me the give me the full deal. Because I think there's different layers to his life. And when yeah. you study him, not as a Bible person, but just as a person, I think it's just a fascinating real person who had real stories to share not only of the grand things that he saw, but it just uh, even of the evolution of his own self. Yeah. What's something you're not very good at? Details. I'm really bad at details. Like if you want me to create a spread, spreadsheet with lots of different information, <laughs> I'm gonna 
just go hire someone to do it for me. That's actually really funny because my wife's the spreadsheet person. I'm, I'm not a detail person either. I mean, I can't, I guess it depends on the application, right? Where I'm at. Um, but for the most part, I, I focus on the bigger picture of things and I get, when it comes down to details, it takes me 10 times longer to do anything than anyone else. Yeah. So put me on a creating like a itinerary for some event and just like, I just, just, just kill me. <laughs> I don't want to do this. Um, what's the vision for the future growth of yourself? Future growth of myself. Mm -hmm. So I have a lot of monetary goals and which is a new one for me because for years as a pastor, I didn't have any monetary goals. It was just like, Hey, I want to make enough money to survive and live and put some money in retirement. But then when I started doing all these other ones, I wanted to see what could I do? And so I have specific numbers that I want to hit in my life at different times, but then I have specific giving amounts that I want to be able to do. So I want to be able to give this amount and then this percent, then this per percent. And in the end, I want to be able to give 50% of what I'm making away to fund all these things that I believe in around the world. So that's a really big personal goal that I have. The second personal goal that I have is to be physically fit so that I can enjoy and not have to pull away from activity with my son through all the time that he's growing up. I don't ever want to be in the spot like, oh yeah, I can't keep up when he's jogging at 15 years old. So I need to stay physically fit for the next 10 years so that I can do that and keep up with him and keep playing with him. And when he has kids, I want to be able to play with them. So first one, financial, second one is going to be in the area of physical fitness. And the third one, some family goals, as in just relationships. And the fourth one is my friendship goals. And so I've had a friendship list for years of just people that I'm keeping in touch with right. and making sure that they're still, I have a whole idea of five levels of friendship. I write about it in my next book, five levels of friendship. And I have these close and intimate friends that I want to stay close and intimate with, even though we've moved away from them. That's awesome. How did you figure out that you, I mean, was this just a process over time that you, you broke it down into different sections of your life that you wanted to work on? Yeah, I was 22 years old and I sat down with a pen and paper and I wrote down one, two, five, and 10. And then I wrote down spiritual, physical, family, friends, financial, career. And I think there's one more that I'm missing off the top of my head. And so I said, and then I created one year goals for all of those two years, five years and 10 years goals for those. And so it kind of mapped out, you know, I was 22. So when I'm 23, I want to be this, do this. When I'm 32, I want to be this. And in some were unrealistic and some were fantastic. And I achieved some, I had a certain amount of books I wanted to read one year and that. So I tried to update that from time to time. What's my one year, two year, five year, 10 year. Yeah. Well, it's been awesome having you on the show. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, I appreciate Andrew. it. Um, do you have any last minute tips or suggestions for anyone before we get going? Yeah, where you are is not where you have to stay. Of course, if you love where you are, then you're welcome to stay there. But be careful because you'll typically end up sliding back just like we talked about. But where you are, if you're in a spot where you hate your job, you don't have to stay there. If you're in a spot where you hate your communication, you don't have to stay there. If you're not a good leader, you don't have to stay there. And really, if you take account of where you're at in life, where you're at in your relationships, you're not a victim of it. You may have been victimized, but you're not a victim of it. So you have the choice that you can make so you can get to the other side. What would you tell somebody, just to, to touch on that point, what would you tell somebody who was uh, close to retirement in a position like that, that didn't like their job, but they didn't think that it was, they thought it was too late in life to make a change. What would you tell them? I've had that conversation. So usually on anything, I don't tell, first of all, I ask. So usually I'm like, so talk to me and really get to the spot where, help me understand. And so if I can get to them to spot, and I love this idea of this, when I'm talking to somebody, help me understand so that you can understand that I understand. So it's this really deep level understanding, like, okay, I understand what you're saying. A lot of people will stop there, but I understand, and you understand that I understand, 
and I understand that you understand that I understand. So <laughs> it goes back a little bit redundant. <laughs> you start, yeah, start losing me. <laughs> but really, there's if I get to a spot when like, oh, you're just tired and you want to retire. Okay, I'm not going to say anything. Okay, go for it. Or if I'm listening and they they say, I just don't believe I can, then I'm going to dive in deeper. Why don't you believe you can? And you know, my dad was 65 when he decided to stop. So start something new and didn't know. What is it you're afraid of? And really getting them to find out what it is that they're really getting at. Because sometimes people say, like thinking about physical fitness, it's just an easy example. You you don't want to get physically fit because you want to eat the food that you want to eat. Okay, I get it. Okay, I'm not going to try to, you don't want to get physically fit because it's too hard. Get it. You don't want to get physically fit because you just never tried. Okay, why haven't you? And there's always more questions that we can ask on top of that. So you I know that I don't have, right. And so let me get it to you. And then if it gets to something that I can speak to, I'll speak to it. But if it gets to something I can't speak to, and you're just tired and worn out and you don't want to work anymore, I get it. Enjoy. Yeah. But if it's, I can't do it, do you need someone to talk to about this? What, you know, what's that next level? Right. Until you get them to realize what that is. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Well, thank you again for being on the show. Yeah, I, absolutely. Uh, I definitely encourage any of you guys listening to this to go ahead and take a look at um, any of his books, really. Uh, and your dad's book. What was the name of that one? <laughs> pirates. I can see the pirates thing, but I can't read the pirates, scoundrels and saints. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm plugging your dad's book on here, but it sounds like a good one. So yeah, no, I appreciate your time. And I know that it brings a lot of value to people who are listening. So thanks. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me on the show, Andrew. Yep. And I really appreciate your time. And thank you guys for listening. I uh, just want to remind you the show releases on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, as well as all audio platforms such as Spotify and iTunes. So be sure to subscribe to whichever platform fits you best. I don't want to miss any upcoming episodes. If you have any suggestions or topics you'd like to hear me cover on here, uh, go ahead and reach out to me at resourcefulagent.com. You can also message me on Instagram and Facebook at resourcefulagent. Thank you guys. See you on the next one. I've got some work to do.